Hey, Whiskey Ringers. I am thrilled to welcome back Impex Beverages as the Whiskey Ring Podcast presenting sponsor. Each month, we'll be talking about a new set of single casks, maybe feature a chosen distillery, or single cask from a chosen distillery. Listen for the mid-roll for more info on this month's offerings. And now, a brand new episode of the Whiskey Ring Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special, what I think will be a bonus episode of the Whiskey Ring Podcast, and something a little different. So today, we're talking about a book that will be coming out as this episode drops, or in the day after, Tell It Like It Is, A Guide to Clear and Honest Writing. And to join me and talk about it is the author, Roy Peter Clark. Roy, welcome. David, I'm delighted uh, to be here and to um, share some ideas and some conversation with uh, your audience. And uh, I'm not sure I've ever had a chance to address an audience exactly like yours. So <laughs> this is uh, uh, this, sh- this should be um, fun for me and I hope for everybody else. Absolutely. So, you know, we're obviously a whiskey podcast first, but uh, you're not the first writer to come on, so feel free to take that burden off. Um, can, I make this, can I say something about, about that right away? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, yesterday, which is, uh, if I could say this, was March 27th. Okay. Is that right? Or was it Monday? On March, mm-hmm. yeah, March 27th, it was Monday, and uh, it was my birthday. It was oh, my well, birthday. Happy belated. My fifth birthday, I was born in 1948. And um, I was educated in what at the time was the kind of uh, canon of uh, traditional canon of uh, British and American literature and uh, read all the significant writers of the 20th century and learned a little bit about their lives and of their experiences and their traumas and troubles. And it's so interesting. My memory is filled with uh, stories about uh, whiskey and uh, other uh, hard liquor, alcoholic drinks, which is to say that it seemed as if, like, um, if you wanted to join the ranks, of Hemingway and Faulkner and Scott Fitzgerald and so many others. Um, great familiarity with spirits um, was a um, almost a, a requirement. Now, uh, often, as everybody knows, um, it, it was not just a, an, an affinity for whiskey, but it was um, um, it was something that uh, that became a problem mm-hmm. uh, in terms of um, um, sort of alcoholism. But the relationship between I don't know genius and uh, and alcohol was um, it was very very uh, deeply ingrained in the in the narratives of um, uh, of good writing. Partly, I think um, it, it was because the idea that to be a good writer you had to suffer, um, and uh, therefore, um, like dissolution was the solution in a way of. Uh, of um, giving you the kind of uh, experiences that, that would give you something uh, to write about. Mm-hmm. It's, someone said to me one time, uh, you spend so much time at the mall, Roy, uh, is that what you're going to wind up writing about? Well, I said the mall could be a dangerous place, you know, if you become a shopping addict. But um, so, you know, I, I'm very interested generally in not just the writing craft, but also the life of writers and and the various paths that writers either choose or or the paths that somehow choose them to lead them to um, 
you know, excellence uh, in their craft. So, uh, given, um, I, I just sort of wanted to sort of strike that note at the beginning, is that these things that we're talking about, um, writing and whiskey, are not, are not unrelated. No, not at all. And I think as I'm looking at my shelf of, of whiskey books and related ephemera, two authors in particular are popping out to me. One being uh, Dr. Edward Slingerland, who wrote a book on drunk, how we sipped and stumbled our way to civilization. Goes a little bit, for, especially for clarity, which we'll talk about a little bit later. He goes into a very clear discussion about how whiskey and other intoxicants depress the prefrontal cortex and allow you to be a little more creative and more childlike and sense of play comes back. So that was certainly one. And then on the other side with Dr. Mark Lawrence Schrod with smashing the liquor machine, I think of, as you said, many, many writers, I think it's fair to say the majority of them of the most famous writers had at least a relationship with whiskey and usually other things as well. (laughs) And, but one of the one of the all time greats, uh, some would consider the greatest, uh, Tolstoy, was a staunch temperance advocate hmm. um, in a a nation that that was fueled by vodka sales for for decades. Um, you know, czarist occupied, czarist run, excuse me, vodka trade until it became the first prohibition nation. So it, wow. it yeah, it's weird that that one. Ex- that one exception comes up, but otherwise, yeah, I think of Hemingway, Hunter S. Thompson, hit their reputed list of his day is something to, uh, yeah. it, it begs the question of how he could survive one day on, on the list that he did. But, sure. yeah. but yeah, certainly, I mean, I'll just to, to give you a sense also of, uh, why I thought this would be a really appropriate conversation for both the audience and, and for, selfishly perhaps myself as well is that this is uh, an audience of listeners who they drink whiskey they drink spirits they want to explore different things they are they're reading tasting notes they're looking at blogs they're listening to podcasts about these things and so over time you listen to your favorites you find your favorites that you like to listen to that you like to read um i take a lot of care in my tasting notes to try to reach that audience. And we'll you know, have a question about that a little later. But in that sense, uh, as much as whiskey writing can be considered in the public interest and of um, as a public writer, I thought it would be interesting to get your take on it and to dovetail that with, of course, the, the release of this book. I have a, you know, I have a favorite writer now of the 20th century and, and the, the interesting thing about her uh and i emphasized her because uh, i uh, i did not uh, you know i went to, to primarily i think graduate school sort of all male catholic schools all my teachers were men and um all the authors that we read were almost all were, were, were men and i didn't um know this writer existed, although I I heard at one point that she was the favorite of Hemingway, and her name is M. F. K. Fisher, M. F. K. Fisher, and I'd be surprised if any of your listeners had heard of her uh, before. Mary, M. F. K., Mary Frances Kennedy, and her married name was Fisher. And from the 40s up until the 60s or 70s, uh, she was known uh, as among the most uh, talented and gifted food writers in America. Um, And um, my favorite book of hers, written during World War II, is called How to Cook a Wolf. And it's a thin volume, still in print. And the wolf, the wolf at the door, is uh, World War II, is the 
the dangers posed by um, by Hitler and uh, the Third Reich, but also the dangers posed to the the health of the the society in general as it was waging a war against the fascism. And the book says this, that we're essentially a a nation at war. And look, you know what that means? Just like the soldiers who are overseas, we here on the home front, we've got to keep our... um, we have to keep our health up. We have to keep our, uh, excuse me for this, our spirits up. We have to, um, uh, we can't, we have to have enough pleasure in life, even at war, that we don't get discouraged. Okay? And so the book contains a series of recipes that you can make with simple available ingredients because many ingredients during World War II were rationed. So at a time of rationing, uh, you could substitute uh, this spice for, uh, for this or this ingredient for that. And if you read the body of her work, and almost all of it has little uh, recipes in it, you sit back and you ask yourself, well, what is this story about? What is this book about? I would never answer. It's about food. Food is the doorway, is the occasion. But it's about country, culture, ethnicity. Um, it's about generational differences. It's about love. It's about companionship. It's about sex. It's about business. It's about all of those those things. And this is a kind of writing. Uh, 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 you didn't invite me because I'm an expert on whiskey writing, but I'm just going to say that I'm very much attracted to that kind of writing, which is devoted to a subject. A specific thing, something that you can taste or hold in, in your hand, uh, but that that thing, that experience is there are stories hidden inside of it. There's there's meaning um, coming off of the edges. And, um, yeah, Mary Frances Kennedy uh, Fisher, MFK Fisher. You won't be disappointed. No, I'll look her up. And as you were describing the style of writing, I couldn't help think of, it's coming kind of from the other direction, from a chef. Uh, Two books by uh, Massimo Vittora, the chef at Austria, Francescana in Italy, um, world famous chef and uh actually got to go there and got him to sign both it was fantastic but he wrote two the first one was never trust a skinny italian chef (laughs) so you know a collection of recipes from from the restaurant but also the stories behind them and how they came to be and uh i think that speaks also to a question i'll ask later which is you focus a lot on the why and why the why is important and he offers some of his reasoning for how for why this came about, how, and the motives for it. And the second one was more of a collaborative work helmed by him, but instead was it's called Bread is Gold. And it's all about the simple, these very simple dishes, not the kind of Michelin star frou frou kind of dishes that you normally expect from him, but instead ones that everyone can make with, as you said, readily available ingredients. And that tie back to all of these different chefs childhoods Mm -hmm. and what drives them and what created their careers. And I just find them enjoyable reading. I go back to them every once in a while, just to read through and enjoy the stories. You know, the, um, one of the habits I've had as a writing teacher 
you know, is that I talk about, I talk to um, writers about their habits and about their process. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to hear the, um, what would you call them? The, the metaphors, the analogies. Uh, when people talk about the writing, sometimes they talk about, um, like they're playing music or composing a song. Mm -hmm. um, other people talk about, um, gardening. Um, uh, I talked, to, I found out the other day that it takes an elephant, uh, an elephant baby, it, it takes a, an elephant baby, what, two years, not nine, not nine months, but two years to gestate. And I said to myself, oh my, you know, that's, hmm, that's kind of like a book for me. It takes me about two years. Mm -hmm. and, and look, a book begins with conception. <laughs> And so does a baby elephant. And so, you know, and there's labor and there's delivery and there's all of those analogies. Um, but, but it's the idea of often comes up of, um, you know, the recipe, uh, that something has ingredients. And you have to, as a writer, uh, kind of sort of learn what those are. Uh, I sometimes refer to that as the the power of the parts. Mm -hmm. And when we eat a meal, uh, or when we drink whiskey, um, we experience it as a whole, completed thing. Um, the parts have. The, have been, you know, they're, they're blended by the time we experience it. Um, and so, and, and even in a, in a recipe book, you know, you usually have a photograph of what the meal should look like when you're finished. But what's the process? What are the steps? Uh, and uh, what are the power of the parts? And if you can learn the parts, uh, then you're, I believe learning the parts and naming the parts allows you, it's the way that all creative acts are um, ultimately uh, learned by those who have a desire to do that. So then uh, I, I think as I'm uh, in preparation for this interview, I was looking back on some of my, and favorite reviews that I've written, favorite reviews I've read of others, and also just previous podcast episodes, and because I keep the interview notes from each one, and more often than not, what I'm trying to find is the the process behind it. You know, not every distillery for the whiskey writer will put forward their their still type, what kind of casks they're using, what kind of yeast they're using, the barley strain, the whatever it may be, and um, to your point, I. One of the things I love most about just doing this process is finding out, okay, why did you choose that strain? Why this cask, you know, why a single cask versus a, a blend? And his whiskey comes down to effectively four things, the grain, the yeast, the water, and the cask. Mm -hmm. So four simple ingredients and time, I guess we want to throw in that, but you know, four or five ingredients and that's it. Yeah. Anything else is flavored or adulterated in some way. Mm -hmm. So there's very little to work with, but by teasing out those things, you can write volumes. There are books written on every part of that process. And to me, that's fascinating. So in um, my, one of my mentors in as a writer and as a writing teacher was uh, a man named Donald Murray. He taught at the University of New Hampshire. He won a Pulitzer Prize uh, in his youth. Um, and um, he, he came to believe that all writers, I'm paraphrasing him, he, he never wrote this sentence, but I, in my under, understanding, 
his um, attitude and feelings about the writing process. That he would argue that all writers in all genres for all time, using all technology, different technologies, have to solve the same five or six problems. Okay? Mm-hmm. And those problems for him became a model for um, the writing process. That uh, I work at, I've worked at a, at a school called the Pointer Institute in St. Petersburg, Florida. And everyone who has taught writing over the years, over many years now, at Pointer has, has used um, Don Murray's model as a starting point. And just to deliver it in the simplest forms, everybody needs an idea. Everybody needs to find something to write about. Uh, everybody needs to uh, explore, hunt and gather, collect. You know, uh, not just sit and think about something, but to, um, uh, to talk to somebody to go somewhere, uh, to take some notes, whatever it is, but to, to, to bring back stuff that's potentially uh, part of the story. The central act, he said, is, so it's, it's idea, collect, it's focus. It's the ability to kind of say, all right, what is this story? What, how is the story shaping up? What is it going to be about? What's at its heart? Um, how will it begin? What will it say to the reader from the beginning? Isn't even, even talk about, I actually sort of uh, added this next stage, since it's so important to me, is select. So if you collect a lot of stuff and you find the focus, then out of all that stuff you've gathered, you have to select, you have to make some decisions about um, what's, what supports the focus of the work. Some point along the way, a kind of an order or architecture shapes up, whether it's a, it's war and peace or a Japanese haiku. It's going to have a beginning, a middle and an ending. And you'll have to figure out where the parts are. And then the, the last two steps, um, which at one time I thought were the only steps were, um, drafting mm. and, and revising. Uh, but I realized that, uh, those things come a lot easier for me if I attend somehow to those, um, you know, to those other steps. Now, the point he makes is that the process is not linear. I mean, you have to describe it in some way. Sometimes it begins, sometimes it begins with, with the drafting. I sit down, I say, oh, hmm, I just, I just had this, I just saw this bird in my tree and it come in, you know, and sort of you'll, you'll write something and, and, and then something will happen and you'll go back and start over. It's, it's more, I think the mathematicians would say it's more recursive. It turns, it kind of more like a cycle uh, mm-hmm. rather than a, um, uh, a straight line. So, um, I think what I just said applies to a lot of the, the photojournalists I know, the visual artists, the musicians, the songwriters, the cinematographers. Um, and um, I assume the whiskey makers. I would hope so. I mean, I, I, more recently, I've been asking the question of intention too. If, uh, you know, intention, asking the intention of the whiskey maker if I can. But even if I can't, to try to say, all right, this is what they put on the bottle. This is what they've put on their press releases and such to say, this is what you should get from it. This is what we intended you to get. And ultimately measure it against that. You know, if you tell me I'm supposed to get something from this whiskey and I don't get it, is that because something is wrong with me? Am I missing something? Is that because you know you say it's there, but it's not really? And ultimately, that's one of the one of my factors in rating is how successful is someone in 
having a product live up to the reputation that it's been given before now, it even gets there. This interests me greatly because um, in uh, in reading criticism of um, uh, of music or food. Uh, or of spirits in some way. Uh, there seems that seems to be almost, um, uh, if not absolutely necessary, of uh, common use uh, by the writers and the critics. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it's called in literary circles is called synesthesia and it just means that it's the mixing of senses so if um if i talk about a bright sound it's a bright sound it, it, can i play a bright sound here we go sure <laughs> That's a bright sound, but why did I call it bright? Because that's a visual, that's a that's a visual thing. But yet I'm applying it to, to something that goes into your ears, and I'm always interested in listening to people, uh, not so much with, for me with whiskey, but let's say with wine, mm -hmm. um, coming up with language that basically is saying, well, this is like this, or this experience that you're going to have from from uh, tasting this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's airy, or it's earthy. And um, it, it's one of the, um, you know, the exciting and interesting sort of literary parts of, um, of writing about uh, these things. And I think the the whiskey lexicon, if you will, grew out of the wine lexicon. You know, the wine tasting and, and accompanying tasting notes arguably came first. I, sure. I don't think there's much argument about that, frankly. And the whiskey grew out of it to say, this is what I get on the nose, on the palate, the finish, what's the mouthfeel, um, the certain sensations. And it's funny you mentioned the synesthetic aspects because uh, I was recently on fortunate enough to be on a friend of mine's podcast uh, called Urban Turntable. And their angle is to talk about whiskey. You know, we tried two whiskeys on the podcast and then talk about you know how I got to here and then talk about music. What was my first album? What was my first concert? Uh, and everything that goes in with that. And synesthesia came up in that conversation as I have it and you can have different forms of it um they're and they're just named very simply i don't know why my words are failing me today <laughs> bad timing uh the types of synesthesia are named very simply by the senses that are combined yeah, yeah. yeah. and and so for me you know i have a couple so i i can drink a whiskey and i'll think oh this is a, a bright whiskey it tastes very uh, acidic or citrusy or just summery in a more esoteric sense uh it can also be earthy it can be fruity it can have a very dark tone to it it just feels and tastes dark yeah. i also have had a whiskey that tasted purple mm -hmm. Interesting. There you go. um and in a good way which is weird um i haven't had one that tasted like seven yet but um <laughs> certainly colors sights and and sounds are all things that I try to convey. And um, uh, before I, I hijack completely, again, one of the the reasons that I really enjoy your writing and, and as I did the research, really started to apply it to my own going forward is the clarity in conveying that feeling to somebody. Did you tell someone, as you said, um, I'm going to play a bright piano tune. You can do that. You say, I, I just tasted this whiskey and it tastes very bright to me. Well, 
all right, I can say a little more that it's citrusy, it's summery, whatever it may be, but ultimately the person is going to taste it and hopefully they'll taste the same thing or maybe they taste something completely different. Maybe they hate it where I liked it or the, or vice versa. So just being as clear as possible in what I mean, if I say something is sweet, it's sugared, honey, uh, fruity, is it earthy? Is it you know leafy, vegetal, decomposition? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or PD, you know, so I think as I, as I push people in tasting sessions to think about this, that's the first thing I think I was like, just think of it as the pyramid. You start at the top with what's that core feeling or flavor or sensation, and then break it down. It's Mm -hmm. spicy. Is it peppery or hot peppers? It's peppery. All right. It's white pepper, black pepper. Where is it hitting you? Yeah. And that really gives a very clear sense to to readers and to tasters of um, what, in some cases, they should be tasting, what they could be tasting, and it gives more of a a memory as well. It you know sense is our our strongest, sorry, uh, scent rather is our strongest sense, yeah, and the most primal one. So the closer you can get, it's also the closest in our brain to. Uh, our memory centers. So if you can create a scent memory, mm-hmm. then it'll be stronger than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I so, think that, which, so the, you know, I, one of my books is called uh, Writing Tools. It's, 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 it's my, it was published in 2006 and it's, it's uh, my most popular book uh, by far and um, one of the early distinctions that I make is that the book is not called writing rules it's called writing tools and rules uh, you know uh, exist in the in the in the kingdom of right and wrong but um, tools uh, making things uh, exist in the world of cause and effect. And so um, you can, I think it's fair to say that none of us who make things can control what um, uh, a reader or a taster or a viewer experiences. We can certainly influence those. I do like to use, um, uh, I actually learned this little lesson. I'm not a, uh, I've been in rock and roll bands uh, since the Beatles arrived in America, but um, I'm not a, uh, I'm not highly schooled in sort of music theory. Um, But I did hear um, a few years ago, about five years ago, Billy Joel was, was exactly my age, in fact, and grew up on Long Island, uh, as I did. Um, he gave a lecture to music students. Uh, he was, I think he had a grant, um, and he was traveling around the country, and not, not giving concerts, but, but playing pieces of songs. And he started to get into some of the, the ways in which we influence, or that he influences the listener. And we started with uh, certain chords and the the effects that they seem to have almost universally on listeners. So here's a star that's uh, C major, right? It's a C major chord. And if I asked a uh, you know if I asked a group of students like what is how's that what does that sound like? You know, they'd say, well, let's that's happy. It feels, um, you know, uh, optimistic. Uh, it's bright, sunshine. Okay, so if I take that major chord, as it's called, those three notes, and I take the middle note, the E, and I go down a half a tone, and it becomes not C major, but C minor. Oh, shit, something has just happened. <laughs> something has just happened but then he said 
he said, there's another uh, underappreciated chord, which is that if you take that middle note and you put it up a half tone, instead of this or this, you get this. He said, there's a little rub in there. There's a little dissonance. We have a name for that. That's called, I didn't know what the name was. That's a, a suspended chord. I played it for my daughter. I said, Allison, what does that sound like? Does it sound like something's about to happen? And I said, what does this sound like? It sounds like something just happened. And so he's getting into all of these emotional effects and how he would use these chord structures to greatly influence what um, what listeners would experience. Now, suspended chord is the same, it's a Latin word, right, suspendere, which means to hang, as if you're like your suspenders, your pants from your suspenders, but also like um, um, a cliffhanger. So um, uh, suspense involves um, in storytelling enforced waiting. Mm -hmm. so the zombies never jump out of the first hole. It usually takes them uh, a little while before they make their appearance. For me, I know that if, if I want to write in a su suspenseful way, especially if I'm approaching something dramatic, my sentences will become shorter. There'll be more periods or full stops. Each period is a stop sign. It slows the pace of the reader. And I want to do that for suspense, I want to do that sometimes for emotional impact. And as my, my book points out, I often want to do it when I'm trying to take a very difficult subject like the pandemic, um, cryptocurrency, bank failures, whatever they are, and it's my job as a reporter as, and a writer is to create civic clarity, to kind of take responsibility for what readers know about the world in such a way, for example, that they might be able to take action, make a decision on whether they will get vaccinated uh, or not, and, and, and when and how. Um, so um, I think we're talking about something essential and maybe even platonic in the sense of you know, these um, not just random acts by a variety of creative people, but um, people who are using creative strategies purposefully, we hope for the common good. And that was interesting. That's where my original thought to to ask you on came from is and it bears out again i i would not consider writing about whiskey to be uh, on the same import of some of the examples that you just gave or even some of the examples you give in the book you know the about the pandemic about cryptocurrency about why someone who is protesting for ostensibly a good purpose or what they think is a good purpose but will destroy property in their own area while doing so and but even even with giving that caveat that i don't think i don't think whiskey writing is as important i still think that if you decide to write about whiskey or talk about it in a podcast or in some other media form that there is a certain responsibility that comes along with it to uh not peddle anything false to have that editorial independence um, to even if you get something for free, I mean, I get samples all the time. I'm very thankful for it and grateful for it. But if something's not good, I'll say it's not good. Um, you have to be independent. 
and uh, is how your book basically starts is with this idea of of clarity which I, I do want to define so people uh, really understand what what we're meaning with that and is that clarity requires the writer's embrace of a mission and purpose to take responsibility not just for the accuracy of the text but for how it is delivered and to the extent possible how it is received and to that end i think about very, that's very well written it's beautifully written i must say yes that that writer must uh, be right <laughs> must be <laughs> as i said it's, I mean, it's not a usual experience for anybody you know to to have their own writing read you know in, sure. in public by somebody else so it's a, it's an interesting experience for me sometimes i'll hear hear that and and say, oh, why didn't I change the order of the words? But um, oh, that was a pretty good one. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think. I mean, it's it's not as succinct as you know, the Queen, my Lord, is dead. True. But you know, Shakespeare is Shakespeare. Um. So again, I, I think there there is a value there that we as a as a whiskey writing community, and I know many of my listeners are are up front that they are of that community of writers and consumers of whiskey media for sure and so um one of the you know one of the questions i wanted to ask and there are so many we're not going to get to all of them we never do on these podcasts so that's perfectly fine but one of them was thinking about that audience so you know you asked before we started recording what is my audience what does my audience look like and i will leave that answer to the nether sphere but you said a writer's sense of audience controls their voice. Yeah. And in that thing, I think I have a good grasp of my own audience at this point. You know, we're in this will be in the 80 something in terms of number of episodes, been writing for about two years, and I, I really do love doing it. But I also had the opportunity to interact with a lot of them. So I know what they're looking for. You know, they don't want to know the same thing that they can read on. The company's site. Yeah. You want to know what are the stills? How did he get to this point? So, but at the same time, you're constantly evolving as a writer. Mm-hmm. So the question after that very long introduction is when creating for an audience, is it possible to write for both your current or contemporary audience and plan in the writing for a future audience to read something? Or does that require ultimately multiple pieces over the course of time? So uh, John McPhee, uh, famous New Yorker writer, still writing. He's got a, a writing book out called The Fourth Draft, I believe it's called. And um, he's a very privileged writer and it admits it. So it's not a book... Um, that uh, that one can kind of uh, follow strategically because he reveals things like um, uh, he he says things like he can't think of more than a time or two when he's ever accepted an idea for a story from a reader. This is a man in his 80s, okay? so he's been an active writer for like half a century. Right? He also says, everything I've written about in my adult life, I was already interested in by the time I was 21 years old. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and I, you know, I mean, that's not the way I learned. So, so uh, to, to me, that actually feels kind of in some tension with me, whereas, uh, yes, I have uh, a set of interests, but I'm really looking for that opportunity uh, to take at least one step outside of the boundaries of my current interest to see something uh, new. As I recently did in writing a story about a 99-year-old woman um, who is a butterfly gardener. So um, uh, 
I, I think that uh, what is voice? We talk about writer's voice. It's the sum. It's the sum of all the strategies that uh, we use um, in piece of writing that creates the illusion that we're talking directly to a writer. I'm sorry. Then we're talking to, directly to readers. I'm going to do it again. Voice is the sum of all the strategies that we use to create the illusion that we are speaking with sound off of the page or off of the screen to, to the reader directly so that somehow the reader can hear us. Um, uh, I have a, a, a friend from high school named Bill Law who was reading the St. Pete Times one day and he was reading the sports section years ago and he said, damn, that sounds like Roy Clark. And he looked up and it was, had my name, it was me. So there was something in it. We hadn't been together for years and years and years, but something about, uh, um, about what my interests are, the language that I use. Um, there's, there's a couple of interesting, I guess, um, so uh, one way to talk about this is that we all, everybody in the world exists, belongs to uh, a group of language clubs. You and I belong to uh, uh, musicians' language club. Okay, we can speak to each other. Uh, in some cases, we haven't done it yet, but we can make reference uh, to language that um, might sound like jargon uh, to people who are outside the club. So I'm a member of. The, the journalism club. I'm a member of the, the West Florida club, which is different than the East Florida club. Um, I'm a member of the St. Pete club, which is different than the Tampa club. I'm a member of the girls women's soccer club because I coached girls soccer for 10 years. Uh, my grandmother was Jewish. My grandfather was Italian. I could tell when my mother was talking to our Jewish relatives and the different, I, I knew who she was talking to because uh, her dialect, if you want to describe it that way, was um, um, slightly, uh, slightly different. And um, what I think is distinctive about my personal voice is that um, I can go, look, I'm a, someone described me as a Philistine with a PhD. Um, I watch professional wrestling on TV. So I can give you all that. I can give you, yeah, I'm 175 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, a tower of power too sweet to be sour. The man, the, man the, I can give you all of those. Those wrestling um, monologues. I don't even know what the the technical uh, language of uh, wrestlers is when they talk to each other. But I can also talk to you about uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas's uh, proofs for the existence of God, if you want to go there. Sure. And and I really I, I like that. I I think Chaucer could do that. Uh, Chaucer could give you the highest degree of spiritual aspiration and he can give you the, um, the bawdiest, uh, filthiest, um, uh, fables about uh, sex and farting, you know, and mm -hmm. right next to each other in juxtaposition to each other. Shakespeare did it, I think, uh, and look, Shakespeare's audience was in a way divided. 
between the groundlings who were standing, by the way. They had actually mm -hmm. the closest view, but they were standing up. And um, the aristocracy. And it's said that the aristocracy, you know, can appreciate the poetry and the groundlings were there for the sword fighting and the, uh, you know, the, Double sexual, um, double entendres. It's more complicated than that. Um, but, um, so, yeah, I, I never know, I never know exactly who my audience is. But, um, but I think about it. And I will make some decisions about things like subject matter, for example. Mm -hmm. I write uh, I write once or twice a month for the Tampa Bay Times, which is a, used to be the St. Pete Times. Now, I've been in the city for 45 years, so I've worked with these institutions and with these journalists. Now, I'm considered a contributing writer, and I write Sunday column. And, um, you know, the people who still like to read the newspaper, holding it in their hands, they mm -hmm. still like to feel the paper in hands, it is fair to say, tend to be older. So, um, people accuse me of writing baby boomer pornography. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a boomer whisperer. What, what is that about? I said, well, look, I know I have a, a good sense of my own experience. And, and so I've written, I, I'll write about Vietnam. Uh, I'll write about uh, the British invasion, uh, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. When Sean Connery died, um, I'm going to write about... Um, uh, 007 and, uh, uh, and those kinds of, um, uh, those kinds of things. So, uh, what's cool is when a young person will come up to me and express affection for something that I, that I've written, that they have just, uh, you know, that just read. So, so that's, that's, that's a very encouraging thing uh, to happen. By the way, it happens quite a bit with my books on writing because young people do experience those books often as early as middle school, high school, college, and, uh, and otherwise. And so I have, um, I have young, I have students who I've never met before. Never been in the same room for who I've had online conversations with, um, who consider me their, their mentor or their teacher. It's a very gratifying thing. This month's Impact Spotlight is on Pokeno Whiskey. Sitting just south of Auckland on the North Island of New Zealand, Pokeno is one of the Pacific Rim's newest distilleries. Founded by whiskey industry veteran Matt Johns, Pocono set out to create a uniquely New Zealand single malt whiskey, one that would bring the lush, subtropical terroir into the world's most recognizable category of malt spirit. I've been able to try their origin and their discovery series, as well as a single barrel double matured and ex-bourbon, and each were truly fantastic. And in case you're wondering whether I really do get to try these things that I talk about or whether I even like them, I'm here to tell you yes to both. If I don't like it, I don't have to talk about it. And I can't stop talking about Pocono to anyone who will listen. As of March 2023, Pocono is just starting to come out into the U.S. market with a rapidly growing footprint. I sometimes say that there are distilleries to watch. This is one to watch while sipping their already world-class single malts. Check out my episode with Matt and Pocono in late March, and order your bottle of Pocono New Zealand single malt today. Hey, Whiskey Ringers. I hope you've been taking advantage of that podcast-only code for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. They've got around 20 bottlings coming out each month, and there's never a shortage of new things to explore. To take advantage of this podcast-only offer, 
please go to smwsa.com, that's Scotch Mall Whiskey Society of America, and put in code WRP for Whiskey Ring Podcast at checkout for 25% off your first year subscription. I mean, it should be. And I, I this was the admittedly the first book of yours that I read. Um, I feel like I had seen excerpts before in, again, in hearing your voice. It is distinctive as your writing voice. And so I finished this book and then I went back and I read uh, writing tools and uh, kill your darling. I'm um, sorry, murder your darlings. Murder your darlings? Yes, murder your darlings. And it had, there was a very consistent voice, but another consistency throughout them was that you could understand them. You didn't need to be a college student or a college graduate or PhD candidate to understand them. In fact, the only portions that I would say that uh, were difficult to understand were purposeful examples you gave of hard to read text. And so I think they're valuable, at, just as valuable as like, I guess the previous generation would look to Strunk uh, and White as their kind of writing Bible, if you will. Mm -hmm. And there are so many topics that came out of it for me that were, were so valuable. I mean, looking at the importance of white space. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you have a PhD. I, abandoned my quest for a PhD, but uh, made it about halfway there. And academic writing is dense. And I was basically told in so many words to fill that page to the margin. I mean, I can remember footnotes that took up more of the page than the writing to which they were referenced. And, and that was okay because that was the type of writing we were talking about, but in, but it's not, that's not clear writing that's meant for, a very specific audience. And uh, I can't believe I didn't pull this out as a question to ask, but it was about the four circles, yeah. the concentric circles that you write about in this particular book. Um, so that would be on kind of the between a three and a four, the PhD theses and things like that. But this book is really one to one to two. I mean, it's meant for people who are both already writers, but also ones who want to become writers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's great that, value in that. That's a good. Uh, that's a good description. I was. Um, I mean, I've never heard anybody else. Look, a lot of the the words or phrases or pieces of advice that I um, that I share are things that I derive from conversations or from reading others or from listening to to lectures. So. Um, uh, this is why I quote Don Murray so often, and, and people attribute things that Murray said uh, to me because they they discovered them in, in my books. And I'll try to always reflect in uh, uh, where that learning came from, so that Murray will say. Um, How do you make something clear? Shorter words, shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs at the points of greatest complexity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Things get big and complex, and what do we do? We go in, we go shorter. We use sentences like, few people on Wall Street understand this. Period. Here's how it works. Okay. And then you proceed from there, slowing the pace of information. But what's interesting about that, the fact I've never quite made that connection until this moment, is that when he says shorter paragraphs, he's ensuring that there'll be more white space on the page. Because white, uh, white space is created by paragraphs. The period, as the period is to the sentence, period and white space is to the paragraph. And this is, there's a little bit of um, spatial reasoning here. It's, I've got one of my books. I have writing tools here in my hand. And if I open it up in a random, on a page, let's, uh, let's do, let's see. 
And here's one. One, two, then there's a list, one, two, three. So there's like five or six paragraphs on a page here. And I look down and there's, there's plenty of white space. Now, um, in fact, when that text was first written, it appeared in a, on a, a, um, a website, the Pointer Institute website. So that's where the early versions of these chapters appear. Well, the column space on a website, or especially on a newspaper page, those columns are narrow. So a long paragraph uh, in a book is going to look just absolutely gray in a narrow column. So in fact, I change the length of uh, those paragraphs very often, depending upon uh, uh, the format and the medium that I'm uh, that I'm working in, so that I say things like I say things to the writers. To me, white space is the most important form of punctuation. You know, think of it that way. Designers and visual artists. Graphic artists like white space, they use it creatively. But to me, the more difficult the content, the more white space I'm going to show you. Uh, I don't know whether you were surprised or not uh, by the first example of, uh, of clear public writing that I used uh, in the book. And it, you remember, I don't know, I'm not giving you a Who's quiz. No, no, I, I, it was the uh, it was the COVID home testing. That's right. Example. Yeah. Yeah. So I just I, delivered, I told you I do my research for these. I just <laughs> delivered to my wife, um, a who had symptoms of COVID. Uh, I administered a COVID home COVID test. Hmm. Opened the box, took out the big sheet. Spanish on one side, English on the other side, some illustrations, some numbers, some directions, nine steps, right? Wait 15 minutes. You see this, et cetera, et cetera. When it was all done, came out. She was fine. The test was negative. We were hoping for. I said to myself, you know, I'm not, I'm a little clumsy in like following directions. These, these directions were really good. Mm -hmm. I said, whoever wrote these, um, I don't know, I have a fantasy, of maybe like a really good English major sitting next to a really a good, uh, uh, like clear scientist or something like that. But yeah, the science has to be right, right? The, the steps have to be there. But, um, just putting white space and, and look, the stakes are pretty high. If you're writing something that someone has to follow to see if they have what at the time, you know, uh, was an even more dangerous illness than we think of it now, two or three years so later. So, um, yeah, that's why for me, the phrase public writers, People say, oh, you're just talking about journalists. No, I'm not talking about journalists. I'm not talking about professionals. I'm talking about anybody who decides to write something, uh, especially with a purpose in, in mind. And especially if it's a, uh, you know, if it's a public purpose, a civic purpose. Um, and that can happen in a um, in an email message. It can happen uh, in a text message. It can happen in uh, uh, in uh, in Twitter. Um, a short sentence, a very short sentence, has. Uh, I heard Tom Wolf 
say this one time to uh, in a conversation with years ago with William F. Buckley Jr. He said, when readers see a short sentence, they often accept it as the gospel, the gospel truth. But short sentences sound truer, some ring more, tr ring truer than uh, than longer ones. Even if the long ones are are um, you know, look. If I know that, um, that's a good thing, but it's not enough. Because if I'm a bad player writing on Twitter, not that that's ever happened, mm -hmm. I can use that strategy for disinformation, right? I can use it for propaganda. Uh, and so for me, that's why craft always has to be linked to, if not mission and purpose, than at least a, a good or useful goal. And I think that uh, provides an excellent intro into what will be probably the question I'm, I'm most excited to ask you, both given the conversation we've already had and uh, your, well, our shared background in medievalism, mm -hmm. but your particular background in, in Chaucer and Shakespeare. So part of public writing, anything from Twitter to the New York Times to um, really anything in between, also involves the the choice of language. And you've described it, I think rightly so, as there, there's an element, I think, of English exceptionalism mm -hmm. um, that I certainly feel sometimes where because English took from so many other languages um, through colonialism, imperialism, um, just flat out bastardization of terms, um, plus from the just natural flow of Latin, Greek, Indo-European, and everything else, we have so many options in English. And I mean, the only other language I know is, is Italian, and I can't speak it anymore, but I can at least understand. And I remember thinking when I used to write in Italian that I was very constrained because there are only so many words I could use for the same thing or to convey the same message. But in English, you've got so many that you can use um, depending on the sentence structure, it's virtually limitless. Right. And so, but that adds to the responsibility to, to use the right word. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the first Part of the question I want to ask you is about Chaucer in particular. Um, in another podcast uh, recently, it was uh, The Love of Language, um, said that he could be called the uh, OG of the English language. He uh, you know, took from 1066 Anglo Saxon, Old French, of course, mm -hmm. Latin and Greek. Um, and it speaks to the reason why we have so many cases of two or more words for the same thing. And I think the, so the first, the question is just what does that mean for our responsibility as writers? So let's start there. What does that mean for our responsibility? Well, um, you know, I think uh, I have an affection. I have a deep affection for the, we don't know who he's, he or she is, uh, he or presumably, for the Beowulf poet. Now, the Beowulf poet, it's a 3,000 line poem. But there's so many interesting things happening in that sort of heroic epic, uh, including with language, that, uh, you know, how should I say it? Uh, there's some, there's some actually some, some good new translations uh, of it. But then, um, right, 1066 comes along, baby, and everything changes. The Battle of Hastings, William the Conqueror, um, the French um, become another 
invader of the uh, uh, of the island and, and and bring with them all of those words. And you're right. So I, I have. Why do we have piss and urinate? <laughs> why do we have lit and illuminate? Um, we have these things because uh, these um, these uh, uh, streams of language uh, float onto the island and into each other. And what's what's so interesting about uh, about Chaucer, and you can get it from the first sentence. I have a book uh, called The Art of X-Ray Reading, where I choose. Um, it was like having my uh, my education in, uh, in English and American literature all, all over again. I picked uh, 25 um, interesting, compelling, or well-known. Um, literary texts and talk about not just what the text, not just the meaning of the text, but uh, did a kind of uh, by x-ray reading, I mean sort of a, a reverse engineering in which you can kind of get at a little bit what Shakespeare was doing, what Chaucer was doing, what Flannery O'Connor was doing in order to create the effect that many of us feel when we're reading a particular text. So that when um, it's, it's not obligatory that I recite the first 18 lines of the Canterbury Tales, but just to, just to give a little bit of the, the flavor of it, if I may, and if that's a good Please word. Do. And I'm doing this from memory, so I may have to, I'm just stumbling along. If, if you if, if you can correct me, please at, at any point. But it's Canterbury Tales, the general prologue, the first eighteen lines. One that upwill with the sure soda, the drop of March at Persa to the Rota, and bathed every vein in switch liqueur of which vertu on genre is the fluid. Okay, so that's. You know, when this happens, so he has about four or five of these clauses. When this happens in April, with the rain and the flowers, when this happens with the astrological uh, signs, when this happens with um, uh, the birds singing, um, uh, all day and all night, you know, so as all of these, uh, I guess that we call adverbial s subordinate clauses. Van mm. uh, longen folk to go on pilgrimage. That's when people, hey, look, he's saying, it's been so fucking cold in England <laughs> all winter. It's been cold and dark. It's finally getting sunny again. Yeah. Come on. We got to get out. Here it is. And pilgrimages were both a form of religious, you know, but they're going to Disneyland too. I mean, it was a way of getting out, going on a, uh, on a trip. And, um, and they're going to, to the, to the shrine of, of uh, Sir Thomas a Becket, the martyr, the holy blissful martyr, uh, who, who to seek him, who helps them when they feel, uh, Malays and sickness. And then 29 uh, pilgrims gather at the Tabard Inn and uh, Harry Bailey, I think, is the name of their uh, innkeeper. And he says, let's have a, a, a it's, you know, we're going to ride on horseback to Canterbury. Let's have a, a storytelling contest, see who tells the best stories. And that gives us, as it turns out, he didn't quite make it all the way, but about 20, 20, almost 29 stories. Okay. So what's interesting, Juan de April, Juan, I think, W-H-A-N, when, with the showers, Shura Sota, the dropped 
drought. That's going to be an Anglo-Saxon word. Of yes. Mars that pierced to the root, pierced to the root, and bothered every vine in switch liqueur. That sounds kind of French. Mm -hmm. Of which vertu, engendre is the fluor. That sounds sort of, uh, that's more continental than Anglo-Saxon. So the reason that we call him, I think, the father, the patron of uh, the parent of <laughs> English poetry is because he really seems to be the first poet that we know of who takes advantage of these streams and who merges them together in the most interesting and creative ways. Now, I don't want to... I want to get to Shakespeare, if I may. Of course. Okay. And um, so high school English teachers have a phrase that they use that they taught me, which I really like. It says that um, they're looking for mentor texts. And a mentor text, it's kind of like x-ray reading. It's it's a piece of writing that teaches you its meaning. Mm -hmm. But it also teaches you, like, it shows you something about how writing works. Okay? So if you were to teach a mm -hmm. story, uh, a famous short story um, written by Shirley Jackson is called The Lottery. Uh, mm -hmm. it was this little town has an annual uh, ritual in which p uh, families and people pick names out of a black box and someone wins the lottery. What you don't know until the end is that uh, the winner gets stoned to death. Oh, excuse me. Spoiler alert. Okay. <laughs> gets stoned to death. Well, when you read it a second time, like in the third or fourth paragraph, these little boys are gathering in the town square and they're picking up stones and rocks and stuffing their pockets with rocks. All right? So we call that foreshadowing, something that you don't quite recognize, not different than foreboding. So I can use that text to teach that strategy if that's what I want to do. Okay. So I'm in Atlanta uh, at a play. My daughter, Allison, is an actor there, and she's playing one of the three witches known as the Weird Sisters in a Halloween version of Macbeth, although she won't use that name because actors are superstitious. And they think it's, say it in the theater. Okay. They say the Scottish play. So I saw the Scottish play a couple of times, and I went home and I read it because I was fascinated with one sentence, six words long. The queen, my lord, is dead. The queen, comma, my lord, comma, is dead. Period. Okay. So um, what happens in the play, the action of the play, is that the Macbeths, based on a prophecy, kill their kinsman, the king, in order that Lord Macbeth can become the new king of Scotland. Even worse, they do it in the Macbeth's castle, where the, the traditional um, bonds of hospitality would demand that you would give up your own life to save somebody who's come into your castle for protection. So all the taboos are broken. And uh, Lord Macbeth is killed in battle and beheaded. And Lady Macbeth, who's even more ambitious than he is, goes crazy, can't, sees blood on her hands, can't wash it off. She screams that she dies off stage. There's a scream. Messenger comes on and tells Lord Macbeth, the queen, my lord, is dead. And all I could think about was, why would I have written it differently? Why would I have written it, the queen is dead, my lord? And it's a nagging question that maybe 
some of your the type of question that maybe some of your listeners will appreciate from I like think so, yeah. different context. <clears throat> so I wrote I wrote it out. The Queen, comma, my lord, comma, is dead. That's Shakespeare. Roy is the Queen is dead, my lord. Then also, my lord, the Queen is dead. When I was teaching this once, a college student in the back said, what about Yoda? <laughs> oh, all right, if you want, dead, the queen is, my lord, something like that. We have six words in four different orders, the same words without any other change. And three of them have the same rhythm, that are the iambic. The queen, my lord, is dead. My lord, the queen is dead. So it's not the rhythm that's different. It's the order of the words and the value of the words in the order. So Shakespeare's is the only version, by the way, that has two commas in it, which I think is a can be attributed in part to he's slowing it down, giving the uh, the actor uh, some choices about um, about pace, how you deliver this. So. That sentence has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And if you go to the middle, that's where Shakespeare places the least important word, phrase, my lord, which you can take out and still have the sentence. The second most important uh, phrase would be the queen, the subject of the, of the verb. And Shakespeare places it in an important location at the beginning. But he places the most important word, the news, if you will, at, at the end, right next to the period or what the Brits call a full stop. This idea that the period is the stop sign. <laughs> and any word that goes next to the period is going to get an emphasis whether you want it to or not. Very important for writers. And here's my problem. Roy's problem is that he's always, not always, but he's often placing the best word in the, in the least emphatic location. So the word is hiding in the middle of the sentence, or even worse, in the middle of the paragraph. <laughs> and following Shakespeare's model, I now know I can circle that phrase with my pen and I can move it next to the period so that I can just be just like the bar. And um, now, I've taught this lesson, David, so many times that when Queen Elizabeth II ascended the golden staircase to heaven, I might, must have gotten a hundred of text messages and tweets saying, Roy, the queen is dead, my lord. <laughs> so, it was, it was payback. However, I cannot tell you how many writers, some of which attended a class or some of which got it out of the book, said to me, damn. I looked at an essay or a story that I wrote a year ago, and I looked at how many times I took a really key, interesting element and placed it in the middle when it could have gone at the end of a sentence. If you put it, David, next at the end of a paragraph, it can float in white space where you you know the reader can't ignore it. So the reader, in news judgment, what is news judgment? To, to take it sort of out of the journalism world. News judgment involves, let's call it a selection or a curation of the events or actions of the day. And extracting ones based on a decision on how important it is or how interesting it is 
or in the most powerful news judgments when those two things combine when something is interesting and it's important we um, hope that readers will pay attention to that in the name of citizenship or community um, sometimes just in a lesser setting uh, entertainment well the way you do that you, you can you can do that on a website you can do it on a page you can take a traditional newspaper page you can make the headline real big you can play, put a big photo on it you can place it at the top of the page rather than the bottom of the page but you can also do it in text and emphatic word order well i'm going to I'm going to turn the sentence around. Perhaps in text, the best way to call attention to something is by emphatic word order. So I just I try to <laughs> I try to recite the sentence in a way that I was. That's not. <laughs> it's hard to do, but um, hey, I understand what you mean, though. Cheers. Cheers. So we. Are near the top of our time. Uh, may I ask you one more question before we go? Mm -hmm. Of course. And and it really relates to many topics that we've been speaking about, but no more so than a uh, quote from Macbeth. By the way, you know why they said why actors say that that play is cursed, right? Well, I have. Uh I mean, if there's an incident with an actor in 1930, um, I don't know it. But I was just assuming that King James was interested in demonology and Shakespeare wanted to please him and put in a lot of ghosts and Jack Dagger. But go ahead. Tell me, please. I mean, it is one of only four of his uh, works that has the ghost in it. So, uh, But it was the last play performed in the Old Globe Theater before it burned down. Yes. So that's why it's considered a curse and bad luck to say it in a theater unless it is during a performance or, yeah. uh, you know, leading up to that performance. Yeah. Uh, but, but so in the fact, in fact, as memory, as long as memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, I will remember uh, uh, that story. I, I could not tell you who told me that, but I, confirmed it was true so we'll go with that so i i kept thinking as i as i read through your works and even as we were talking tonight and going back to the shakespeare quote and all of these different examples the importance of sentence structure writ large and i mean i'll admit i i think i received a pretty good education um also grew up on long Island, went to public school good public school to Binghamton, you know, uh, I feel like I got a good education. And yet, if you were to ask me a few years ago to diagram a sentence to say this is this this is the subject, um, maybe the verb would have been easy, but this is the subject, this is the object, here's where the clause is, the dependent clause, the independent clause. Um, and not only to diagram it, but also to say why is it important. That was not part of the education. And right. you know, most I think most of us, and I I don't I try not to generalize, but I think this is valid that most do not consider sentence structure on a daily basis. They may not have even been taught sentence structure in more recent decades. So as someone who is interested in sentence structure and to your point about how rearranging words can have an incredible impact on which words are emphasized and which words are subsequently hidden as well. What work of yours or of someone else's would you point to as the best starting point for understanding sentence structure? Well, there are, I wrote a book called the, the second book in, so, so I, um, my new book, Tell It Like It Is, is the seventh book in a, I call it a, not a series, but a sequence maybe, 
of books that published um, over the last uh, dozen or so years for um, for Little Little Brown. And when Writing Tools came out and um, and was successful, my editor asked me if I wanted to write a grammar book, and I I've never thought about writing a grammar book, and I told her no. <laughs> and um, uh, but um, you, you know who was it? It was um, um, Barbara Walters who interviewed a songwriter named Sammy Kahn, famous songwriter from the 30s and 40s, I would think. And she asked him in an interview that I saw, I was witness, um, on TV, said, uh, Sammy, I've always been curious, what comes first, the melody or the lyrics? He said, oh, what comes first is the phone call. So, um, which means, you know, hey, hey, listen, we got this, uh, this movie, uh, The Wizard of Oz, and we need this thing with a rainbow, and uh, can you fix us up? So, um, I would not have written that book without, um, having been asked, but I had to kind of, uh, I'm not a grammarian, I don't consider myself a grammarian in, in the, in the traditional sense or in the conventional sense. Um, I consider myself, uh, or the Chomskyan sense, I consider mm -hmm. myself uh, a rhetorical grammarian. Okay? And so in that book, uh, there's all kinds of um, advice. There's 11 chapters, for example, on punctuation. But... Mm -hmm. Um, it's how um, how the semicolon, for example, uh, can um, like if you think of the the semicolon as a swinging gate that creates some separation, but also like some uh, connectivity of meaning as you move from one part of the garden to another. So I'm very much sort of interested in uh, um, in that way of thinking, of uh, grammar and punctuation as tools of making meaning. Now, late in my career, well after I had my PhD, I think probably this gets to, to Chomsky uh, a little bit. Uh, is that a, um, a writer named Dennis Jackson came and uh, introduced me to a different way of thinking about sentence structure. And it was not like um, simple sentences or complex sentences, compound sentences, those three or four traditional uh, ways of thinking about sentence structure. The question was, where... Is the, where does the subject and verb of the main clause, where do they appear? Hmm. And, and how do they, how does that decision affect the experience of the reader? My first writing tool is, you know what, I gotta look it up to quote it directly. So I know what the second one is. The second one is order words for emphasis. But the first one is begin sentences with subjects and verbs. Okay. Now, I don't mean all the time. It's not a rule. Um, but if you think of a sentence, not as a row of, of lines, but if you think of a sentence as one line, no matter how long it is, from left to right, in English, to create, if I want to create the most clarity, I'm going to put the subject and the verb of the main clause early in the sentence. A tornado ripped through a tiny town in Alabama Thursday, comma. That sentence can go on to a thousand words. If I, did, I can describe all the 
the um, uh, the destruction that it was caused, or and people will understand it because they will understand what happened. The main thing that happened: a tornado ripped through a tiny town in Alabama. Okay, mm. a lot of mischief occurs with the separation of subjects and verbs. Mm. The executive vice president of one of a chain of companies that did business with Florida Power during the Arab oil embargo was arrested Thursday. For, but somebody was arrested. Who was arrested? If you find yourself moving your finger up the page to try to figure out who did what, okay, the only time that works is in an obituary because Everybody knows that the verb is like died Thursday or at the end. <laughs> so now there are times when you don't put. Uh, so th the clearest and most regular way of organizing a sentence, especially if your goal is clarity, is to do that. Subject and verb, main clause. But if you flip flop it, it has, uh, and it's always had, um, a kind of, um, interesting, special, dramatic effect. Sh uh, Chaucer didn't do that. Chaucer did not write a right branching sentence. He put the subject, uh, at the end, the, the main clause. Then long folk to go on pilgrimages. When this happened, when this happened, when this happened, here's, here's a news lead, one sentence. You can think of Chaucer if you like. Before the prayer warriors massed outside her window, before gavels pounded in six courts, before the Vatican issued a statement, before the president signed a midnight law and the Supreme Court turned its head, Terry Schiavo was just an ordinary girl with two overweight cats, an unglamorous job, and a typical American life. Terry Schiavo, you know, was a person who, um, uh, the controversies about whether she was brain dead or not, and whether to take her off life support. Well, she, she lived and died very close to where I'm sitting right now. But Kelly Benham decided, writing her obituary, decided to go with something a little bit more dramatic. Before this happened, before this happened, before this happened. Who was this person? She was just a typical American girl. These three examples. So that's the way I like to think of um, sentence structure. Uh, I like, I do like to think of variety of sentence length. And I often, uh, for educational purposes and for myself, something, I'll count the number of words. Just to look at the numbers to see, uh, you know, how they um, how they sort out. And even if you have eight short sentences in a paragraph, for example, you can vary the lengths of those short sentences to create a kind of uh, a pleasing rhythm rather than something that's um, uh, that's monotonous. So, um, yeah, I, it helps me and seems to help students more to talk about those strategies rhetorically rather than just technically. I think that makes sense. It's it's a real world example to put in a different language. It's it's on the page. So with that, I know there are so many more questions that I could ask and and hopefully we'll get a chance to at some point. But Roy, thank you yeah. for taking the time. Hope thank you enjoy it. Uh, oh, I enjoyed it greatly, and um, will you give me a heads up when um, can I share it? Will I be able to share it with others? And, uh, ab absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Please do, please do. Uh, you know, to listeners, I hope everyone who listens to this takes at least one thing away. I have a couple of friends in mind who I know definitely will. But you know, if you're getting into the world of writing, of whiskey writing, or other writing, or media, or just speaking, anything with language. Think about what think about your audience, think about your sentences. I highly recommend having read it, which I can't say for every interviewer, but I make sure to read the books. So I can highly recommend Tell It Like It Is, a guide to clear and honest writing. There will be a link for it 
to either pre-order or order, depending on the date in the show notes. Um, and this will come out again a day or two before the epi- before the episode, <laughs> before the book yeah, goes live. So wonderful. So with that, I will sign off on this episode. Roy, hold on, hold on with me for just a second. And hope you all enjoyed this extra episode of the Whiskey Ring Podcast. Hey folks, thanks for listening to another episode of the Whiskey Ring Podcast. If you like what you hear, please go ahead and click that subscribe, follow, or like button. Leave a rating and review on your podcast app of choice, and let me know what you want to hear. You can reach out to me through the podcast apps or email me at david at whiskeymywedderring.com with any suggestions or ideas for new show guests. You can also support the podcast at patreon.com slash whiskeyinmywedderring. That's whiskey with an E for as little as a dollar a month. $5 a month gets you access to bonus content, including our soon to resume under the influencer series. And $25 a month means you join the barrel share club. Each month, barrel share club members get to try products sent to me for review bottles from my own collection, and sometimes bottles that I just pick up because they're fun or interesting. Right now, only five spots remain in the Barrel Share Club, so grab your place today. Finally, please follow on Instagram. You can follow me at Whiskey My Wedding Ring or at Whiskey Ring Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Whiskey Ring. You can follow on Facebook at Whiskey My Wedding Ring or join the Facebook group, the Whiskey Ringers group. And I hope to see you there. Cheers. Thank you for the support and see you next time.